Hi is a web development and uh, digital marketing agency. We work in several platforms such as Kentacle, Umbraco, um, Sitecore, and, Dru and Drupal. And then of course we also work in WordPress. Uh, another role I have at Wakefly is that I get to be their evangelist in WordPress. So that means I get to learn the ins and outs of uh, what WordPress is and how to use it. So about a year ago, they started to introduce Gutenberg. So I sat down to begin to learn it. And what I found was I was able to do some really simple things with it, such as create a text box. But I wasn't able to do uh, more complicated things because I was just getting confused with how to do it, what it was, how it was doing what it was doing. So when you get confused by something, you know, open the source code. And as soon as we opened that source code, what we realized was that Gutenberg is just React. And so as we started to learn React, a lot of things about Gutenberg just became uh, understandable and we were able to start doing things that we wanted to do. And that's actually the real goal of this presentation today. It's not to teach Gutenberg. It's not to make you experts at React. It's to start to introduce you to core concepts that we found useful uh, as we were learning Gutenberg. So these are just some uh, links for you guys. Uh, the first one is uh, questions. If you have any questions, that QR will be throughout the uh, presentation. You can take a, a screenshot of it, and it will expose a form for you. Uh, and we'll be able to uh, put your question up on the screen uh, at the end of the presentation. We also have helpful resources. Uh, that's just a blog that we wrote, um, and it's just a lot of useful information. Gutenberg's uh, tutorials and documentation has gotten really good. So those are some uh, you know, resources that we thought would be useful for you guys as you learn Gutenberg and React. And the last one is just the presentation itself. We are making these slides available for you, so if you uh, want them, you guys are welcome to them. And what we'll cover, we're going to cover uh, Gutenberg really quick, just kind of what it is. We're going to take a quick look at JSX, and then we're going to go into some React core compo uh, concepts. So what is Gutenberg? Gutenberg is about to be released uh, November 19th, uh, so it's coming out quick. And what it is, it is WordPress's new content editor. So if we take a quick peek with my mouse. At this, this is just a video of me just kind of messing around with uh, Gutenberg itself. Oh, if we just take a quick peek. So this is a brand new editor that we see here. Um, on the right hand, we have our document fields, and then we also have our block fields. Uh, we don't have a block selected yet, and we're just going to throw in a quick title real quick. Um, and then if we hit the plus mark on the top hand side, uh, what we see are all these blocks. And WordPress organizes these blocks into different categories. And uh, these blocks we'll later on be able to use uh, to create page content. And then I know it's hard to read, but those last two categories was widgets and embeds. Uh, for anyone that's used to WordPress right now, those are indeed the same exact widgets and embeds that already exist. It's just rewritten into uh, Gutenberg. So what we're going to do is we're just going to drop a paragraph on a page. Uh, put some text in it, hello, I'm a paragraph. Um, and then when we, uh, then we can expose the editor control. And these are just little editors. We can uh, do alignment, um, you know, delete, uh, add, make it bold. And then on the right-hand side, we have more controls where we can control things like the color, uh, the text size, class name. And for a developer, you actually have control all, over all of this. You'll be able to add your own controls. and um, kind of create the whole system that you want. In this case, I'm actually exposing a drop case. I kind of just want to demonstrate that when you click into it, that drop case disappears. When you click out, it'll come back. It just makes it easier for an editor not to have to edit with a drop, drop case in there. And then the next thing we have is uh, transforms. And this is a really cool part, is that we can take one block and we can transform it or turn it into another block. So we took this paragraph block and we just turned it into a header. We're just going to quickly throw on another block. And this block, we're actually going to review again later. Uh, it's just the recent post block. And again, we have fields on the right-hand side where we can kind of control what we want. Uh, we're going to reorder it real quick. We're going to take a look at the categories. And then we can add a larger amount of posts. 
And then it's important to note that I also added the date of the post. Here I actually just realized that how many blocks I actually put on, or how many posts I actually put on, so we're just gonna bump that down a little bit. And then a lot better. So the next thing we can do with blocks with Gutenberg is that we can rearrange them. So we're just gonna drop that header below um, the recent post, and as you see, it's really that easy. The next thing is we can insert blocks before a block or after a block. And we're just gonna answer, uh, it immediately adds a, a paragraph, but we can change that to anything. Um, and so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna add an image block real quick. And then the last thing I just wanna demonstrate is that after we add this image block, if we decide that we didn't want it, we could easily delete it as well. So that's the new Gutenberg editor for a content editor. It's just a system of blocks that you can use to create page content. For developer, it's a system of blocks written in React uh, with an abstraction layer written over it. Um, and that's what Gutenberg will provide. And for most people, that abstraction layer is what you're gonna focus on when you read tutorials. And for the most part, when you write Gutenberg blocks, you can pretty much stay within that abstraction layer. All right, so real quick, what is React? React was developed by Facebook in 2011, and it's just a JavaScript library, uh, and it's designed to be able to build useful uh, interactive user interfaces. And in the end, what it boils down to is just nestable components. It has a root component, and that root component will contain child components, and it'll build out into a tree. And this is what I mean by that, and this is actually that recent post block that we just looked at. So if we took a look at how they built this in React, we actually have a root component called fragment right here, and then we have an unordered list. Um, and that unordered list can contain a variety number of list items, and then each list item could have an anchor. And remember when we added the date, uh, that would add a time com uh, component as well. And so this is just what we mean by a tree. The other thing to note about this tree is that in terms of data, it's unidirectional, so data should flow from the top down, so it should start at the fragment and it should flow down all the way to the anchors and the time. Next, what is JSX? And I'm just throwing this in there because we're gonna see JSX throughout these examples. If you open up Gutenberg, they write in JSX. If you open up most React apps, they also write in JSX as well. So JSX is just an XML, HTML like syntax that's used to extend ECMAScript. Um, it's actually very visual, it's very verbose, and anyone that has worked with HTML should be able to recognize it right away. Uh, the next thing is it's intended to be used with a preprocessor pre such as Babel, so you write in JSX and you compile it back down to JavaScript. And the two important things to know with JSX is while you're writing in JavaScript, if you want to add JSX, you would delineate it with smooth brackets, and if you are in JSX and you want to add JavaScript, you would delineate it with curly brackets. And this is what we mean by right, this is what we mean right here. And is this readable? Can you, not really? I'm just gonna edit this real quick. I'm just gonna make this big for you guys. So if we, look, if we look at this code, uh, ignore this right here. This is actually Babel. I'll explain that out later. Uh, but if we just look at this, we have a var list. Um, and then inside our list, we have a, a div node. Uh, we have a h3 node, a ul node, and a li node. And the important things to note about this node, these nodes again is that it's not HTML. It is re a React node. And it's important to know because React nodes don't get rendered straight to the, to the DOM it actually gets rendered to a virtual DOM first, and then React does a lot of comparisons to figure out uh, what has changed and enact that change on the DOM at that point. The last thing we do is we just call React DOM dot render, we pass it a list, and then we uh, attach it to the element that we want. In this case, we just attach it to app. And really, that's what JSX is. And as you can tell, again, very similar to HTML. 
And if we were to compile JSX down, again, if you just excuse me. Uh, this is what we get. And as you can, t uh, anyone that knows JavaScript would immediately recognize this as just JavaScript. That's all it is. We took that JSX, we ran it through Babel, and it outputted JavaScript for us. So you technically don't need to use JSX with React, but as you can see, that it's just a lot more readable. Uh, you could use JavaScript, but then it just gets really complicated to read at points. So getting into React, um, and what React is, it's just a logical grouping of nodes. You know, so when we saw that recent post, it was a, it was a logical grouping. It had the fragments, it had the unordered list, it had the allies. You know, so if we looked at the example on the last, last slide, it was just a div containing H3s. Um, you know, so it's just a logical grouping of nodes. It usually represents an independent and reasonable part of a UI and most typically contains some sort of state. And we'll actually review the state in a little bit. The other thing about a component, it must accept an arbitrary input called props. Um, and then it outputs a React node. And I say React node, but that's actually kind of false. Uh, you can also output null. And I'm just bringing that up because for WordPress, it's uh, a little bit important because if you pass null, you're actually indicating you want um, your, your component to load uh, with PHP instead of JavaScript. Uh, the last thing as we keep talking about is components can contain other components and it creates a component tree. So if we look at what co the component code would look like, if we, uh, we can see that we have a class called clock uh, and we just re extend React node and we have a render function within it and all we're returning is a JSX node uh, and that's that P tag right there and we're just adding in you know, uh, the, current day, uh, the current time and the sample on the right is what the time was when I did this. And then uh, we render it and we just call, uh, like an HTML attribute, we just call clock uh, within React DOM render. And that's how simple a component is. And in the end, when we look at a Gutenberg block, a Gutenberg block is a component. This is a component right here. So this is, in the end, this is really how simple it can be. So when we have that clock, you know, we weren't passing any data to it, so it can be pretty useless. So how do we pass data to a React component? And we would actually use props. And props is just like an arbitrary input, as we mentioned earlier. Um, it kind of, you can just kind of think of it as it provides configuration values for the component. It functions similar to uh, HTML attributes. And inside the React component, it's accessible through this dot props. The most important thing to know about props is that they are immutable. The data is immutable. Once it's set, you shouldn't change it. And because React in the end is just JavaScript, technically as developers, we could change it. But if we did, we risk screwing up React's uh, internal syncing, uh, which destroys our app. And then it's just a pain to debug. So once you set your prop, they're immutable. They shouldn't be changed. And if we look to see how we pass props to a clock, what we notice here is, again, we have our clock. Uh, we're passing it date, and we're passing it class name. And then within our render function, we're setting class name with this dot props class name and this dot props that date. So that's, again, how easy we pass props. It looks very similar to HTML. And uh, we can use them using this dot props. So we said that props was immutable. It can't change once you set it. So sometimes we have data that is going to change, and a lot of times that is what we're passing to our components. So when we have data that is going to change, we're going to use state. And all state is is just data that can change over time. So when we have data that we know is always going to be the same, we use props. When we have data that we know is going to change, we would use state. A state change can trigger a re-render of the component or the subcomponent. And once the state is set in the constructor, uh, you shouldn't affect it uh, directly. We, uh, instead, we would use a function called this.setState. 
And if we just take a quick look at the code, uh, again, we're just using our clock example. Uh, we're still passing it uh, class name. And uh, this time, we're passing it starting time. And when we look at our constructor, we see that we have this dot state. I'm setting TOD, which for me means time of day. And then if we take a look at our render function, uh, we're just extracting class name and starting time from this dot props, and we're extracting time of day from this dot state. And what we can, um, and, so, and also in our render method, we just have a H1 showing the starting time. We have a paragraph showing the um, time of day, and then we have a button to update the time. And we, if we looked at, and if we look at what happens, what we see is that the starting time does not change, and the update time does change. So 32 at this point, 35. Um, and so again, remember, starting time we use props because we know starting time is never going to change. The update time we use state because we know the update time is going to change. Uh, the next quick thing we're going to cover is just uh, life cycle. So our clock is still pretty useless. Uh, when I imagine a clock, I imagine something that's ticking and continually updating. Uh, so how would we cause, uh, or how would we uh, set up, you know, a uh, interval for our clock to continuously update? And we have the ability to uh, use a life cycle. So a component has a life cycle. Um, and it's just points within that component's life where we can affect change through code. And for WordPress developers, you can think of it very similarly to uh, action hooks and filters. And so this is actually a diagram by uh, Dan Abramoff. He actually works on React, and uh, this is just a great diagram. But what we can see is that we have three stages. We have a mounting stage, we have an updating stage, and we have a unmounting stage. And uh, within those stages, we have a variety of methods. The most important methods that I tend to use is component did mount, component did update, and component will unmount. And in the example, we're going to see um, how we use it to set up um, an interval. And so again, we're just keeping with the clock example. We're still passing it class name and starting time. Um, but if you notice in our render, we took out the button. Uh, we're not going to use it anymore because the time is going to update itself. And instead, we create a component did mount. Right? And the component did mount will trigger as soon as this component is rendered to the DOM. And that will trigger. So as soon as that's rendered to the DOM, we want to set up our timer and kick it off. And that's what we're doing here with this dot timer. And within it, we set an interval for every second. And we change the date to the current time um, by setting this dot state. The last thing we do is component will unmount. And that executes right before we, we remove a component from the DOM. Um, and all we're just doing here is clearing the interval because we should take care of our assets and get rid of them if we don't need them anymore. And so when we look at this example run, we'll see now we just have a clock that ticks. So we've already seen handling events, and I just kind of want to touch on it to make sure everyone knew that we, uh, took, that we took a look at this. So we just backed up again to uh, an earlier example where we have our uh, but where we're, where we're turning a button, and this is just an event handler. And pretty much in React and JavaScript, events are handled the same way. The one big difference is that on a button, uh, we pass it through a function uh, instead of a string. The other important thing just to remember is that in in JavaScript and also React. Um, Class methods aren't, uh, this isn't immediately bound, bound to our class methods, so we actually have to bind that ourselves. And that's actually what we see in our constructor is that this the update time, which we're going to use as our handler, we're just simply binding this to it. And the last piece I want to cover, and this is just because we see this throughout all of Gutenberg, um, actually, you're going to see it throughout all of our uh, React apps is lifting state. And so when we have, and lifting state is just a, a React pattern, uh, just how we do something. Um, and when we have two or more components that depend on the same changing data um, or the same state, uh, 
we, uh, if we want them to be synchronized and to be able to use the data from the same source. We call that a single source of truth. So in our example, uh, we'll have Celsius and Fahrenheit, and when we update Celsius, it will also immediately update Fahrenheit and vice versa. So both of them are dependent on the same temperature to calculate what it would be in both degrees. All right. So how do we make it so that they're both dependent on the same thing? Obviously, we're not going to set state on each of these um, temperature inputs. What we're actually going to do is we're going to remove that state and move it up to the closest ancestor that they both have and pass down that temperature as a prop. And that's why we call it lifting state. We take that state and we move it up. And so if we take a look at the code, we see we have our temperature input. On our example, we have that Celsius temperature input and that Fahrenheit temperature input. Uh, and what we notice is that everything is run through props. So if we take a look at the on change, it's calling this.handle change, which immediately is calling a function that was passed through this.props and sends the whoever is sending that function, it sends it the value or the change to value so that we can use it. And then if you notice, we also have a constant called temperature, and it's called from this.props.temperature2, which both temperature inputs would receive. If we look at the calculator, so if we notice our calculator is here, um, and then we, it has two temperature inputs, and the calculator or the closest ancestor of both these temperature inputs is the one that's sending it um, its handler. And so when the value changes, it actually gets sent to these two handlers. And again, it is the closest ancestor that is handling the change um, and setting the state. So what we actually went over today real quick is that Gutenberg is WordPress's new content editor. JSX is just ECMAScript. Uh, extension is just a way to build nodes in a HTML-like syntax. Um, a new component is just a function that takes an arbitrary, an, uh, an arbitrary input called props and outputs a React node. In the end, a React component is a Gutenberg block. We need to remember that props are immutable, and a component can also contain state or changing data, and that's how we decide if we're going to use props or state is is it changing data, or is it always going to be the same? Uh, React component has a life cycle that we can take advantage of. They're very similar to WordPress's action hooks and filters. Um, and if several components depend on the same prop, then a helpful React pattern is lifting the state or moving the, or moving the state, to, I misspelled that, moving the state to a prop and attaching it to the nearest ancestor of all depending components. Okay. Any questions? Yes? Um, you mentioned that if you pass no, that's telling the application to render it in PHP versus React. Is there any example that you can think of that uh, you want to do that? Yeah, so I was actually talking to a gentleman yesterday, and he was talking about how he wants to build a Gutenberg block. Um, it would be recent posts, actually the same recent posts that we saw. He wanted to do something similar to that. Uh, when you're developing recent posts, you tend to send, um, if you're doing it in JavaScript, right, you need to send a post back, an Ajax post back to it, and say you don't want to do that because it's just faster to do it on the server. That would be an example where we'd want to use PHP instead because it's just easier to query for those recent posts and just send it through a template and to display out. Anyone else? No? Yeah. Beautiful. All right. Oh, yeah.
Yep. Um, I, so I haven't done a lot. A lot of it has been uh, a bunch of learning, but one kind of project that I'm using as I'm learning, and it's actually a great way to learn this, so uh, anyone should uh, try this out if you have a chance, is because uh, we actually don't want to focus on the front end because you know that just distracts us from actually learning Gutenberg. So we just took Bootstrap, we threw it on a site that's handling our front end, and then we, you know, because Bootstrap has all of the different components, we started picking out different components and saying, we're well, going to turn that into a Gutenberg block and just attempting to turn that into uh, something useful. Cool. Yep. Just getting back to the front end, uh, will all these uh, developments be eventually ending up on the front end of Gutenberg in different versions to add more functionality to it? Yeah, so there's, um, there's a lot of developers that are already developing Gutenberg blocks. Uh, a lot of the existing plugins are already getting prepared for Gutenberg blocks. Uh, so yeah, it's going to be something that we're going to see uh, pretty soon, October, uh, November 19th, so a couple of weeks. Um, and yeah, I know a lot, of, uh, a lot of people are actually already getting prepared for it. A quick note about all that too is that you're not going to be forced into Gutenberg, and I know a lot of people are worried about that. Uh, they're not forcing you into Gutenberg. Uh, there's a couple of things you can do. Uh, the first thing is actually pretty bad, and that's just don't update. Do not suggest that. The second thing is actually the better option, and that is to use a class, classic editor plugin. Um, and that's just a simple plugin that WordPress put out there. You throw it on your site, you enable it, and it'll stop blocking out uh, Gutenberg for you. So um, you can just stick with the classic editor. Uh, at Wakefly, that's actually what our general plan is for uh, all our clients, is that when we update them, we're going to throw on classic editor first so that then we have time to start testing their site and figuring out once we enable Gutenberg, kind of what we need to do and, and how we're going to do it and what problems we may face and how to attack those problems. Yep. So in the sense of Gutenberg, you were showing like the like, um, settings for like a paragraph, like the colors mm -hmm. So with, with uh, React itself, we want to break everything down into independent blocks. So when we saw that example, what we actually saw was uh, that was actually a React component. And how much time do we have? Do we have time to do this? I got time. So I'm actually going to do something a little scary that I was going to avoid. But we're actually just going to open up Gutenberg. All right, we're going to just take a quick look at the uh, source code. I actually need to pull it out of my trash can because I threw Gutenberg away. Alright. loading up my IDE. So my IDD does not want to work right now. So we're just going to do it this way. Oh, that's because I have two screens, so I don't see what's going on on the other screen. All right, there we go. Computer froze. Here we go. All right, so this is just Gutenberg right here. And um, when I say, uh, I, I kind of put notes throughout the thing about looking at Gutenberg core. And when you want to look at Gutenberg core, sorry, not lib, uh, packages, uh, this is what we need. This is just a lot of uh, Gutenberg. And then the one thing we can look at is we can look at the um, lock library. 
and then inside here we can go to our uh, latest uh, latest post and then we're just gonna look at their editor we're actually gonna edit it with notepad alright and so in the end all this top stuff is pretty scary you just you don't really need to know this but um, but what we see is that we have, uh, you know, it's just bringing all of this stuff right here are just components to use throughout the thing. Um, and then if we look here, we just have a component called inspector controls. And that's exactly what you're talking about right there. So all it is is a component, and then we can pass it other controls that we want to use. So if we notice, we actually pass it, uh, they're actually passing it a, a panel body, and they give that panel body a title. Then they also pass it query controls, toggle controls, and possibly a rage control, depending on if it passes that check, right? Um, and then within that, we can set different attributes, and uh, we can pass it uh, a number of props to determine what it's going to do and how it's going to act. So when we look at just this is just their editor, and this is a good example of just components containing other components, um, and this is uh, um, the actual code itself of Gutenberg. Make sense? Yep. So what can I expect if I have a whole bunch of client sites and I switch over and I update them? Are some of them going to behave strangely? Like possibly not? What about the whole front end look fine? Is it just to be? Possibly. Yeah. So, so I, might, I might have some issues. Yeah, so I mean, the big thing to do is to test it first, always test it first. Um, and for the most part, what I've seen is that when I took a site that used something else, say the classic editor, and flipped it into Gutenberg, uh, what I saw is that Gutenberg intelligently, intelligently just took that content and dumped it into a classic editor block. Right? So if we opened up Gutenberg, one of the options that we had as a block was just a classic editor. Um, and so they were doing really a really good job of just taking that content and dropping it into there. That doesn't guarantee it's always going to work, but that's just uh, kind of what I've seen. Um, the other thing uh, for developers is we have uh, the transformation API. Uh, when I showed you we had that paragraph block and we moved it over to our header block. That's just called the transformation API. Uh, we also have a migration API that as developers we could take advantage of, right? Because essentially we're just saying take the content that looks like this and turn it into that, right? And so we could say, all right, take this plain content right here that you see here. If you're using short codes, take this short code and change it into this block. So that's, yeah, so the custom fields with the post meta, um, Gutenberg can actually take care of that. Right? So you can actually attach post meta still with Gutenberg. So that's not, uh, for me, that's not as much of a worry. It's the bulk of the content itself that I tend to get worried about. Yeah, and um, like I said, we're going to use classic editors. We're going to take advantage of transformation API and the uh, migration API. Yeah, so I've been taking a look at that because we actually use ACF quite a bit uh, where we work. Um, and so I haven't seen ACF really deal with it yet, but if I was them uh, and doing something in terms of just making it compatible, I would just take advantage of the fact that we can already attach post meta to a block. Um, and I would imagine that because they're just so big that they would have a solution out before we, uh, we went up, we launched. But, Post meta is part of Gutenberg still, so we still have you know things like ACF. Anything else? Yep. Uh, from what I've seen of Gutenberg so far, it does the same things that the classic editor does. It's just a different grouping in there. Exactly. So a lot quicker, you can do a lot more things quicker on the fly mm -hmm. than you could in the classic editor. Exactly. It's it's a better UI, and the whole point of doing Gutenberg because like every, everyone sees a classic editor, right? And it's kind of outdated, like, so we work with uh, platforms like Kentco and Umbraco, and if you look at the UI, right, um, it's really just modern. You drag and drop, you have all these edit fields um, and edit panels, and then you look at WordPress and it's very basic. There's not a lot there. And I went to a presentation where they were talking about this, and the whole point of Gutenberg is that because if we keep the classic editor, 
especially with the younger generations coming up and expecting you know, very modern tooling, we're gonna start losing our market share, right? And WordPress is very fortunate right now where we hold a good part of the market share. I think I saw 60% of CMSs at one point. And, uh, and so the benefit of being that big is you get developers, you, it's open source, so you get a huge community of developers to develop for it, a lot of tutorials out there, and we definitely don't wanna lose that. So this is a point of Gutenberg, it's to give us modern tooling so that we don't lose our market share. Exactly, and I think content editors are gonna love it because you know it's not a lot of the classic editor where it's kind of funky at points and sometimes you do have to go into the source to do what you wanna do. With the block editor, you should be able to just drag and drop your blocks and rearrange and use your panels. Well, I remember when I started using WordPress when mm -hmm. I first looked at the classic editor, I mean, come from like, you know, Word. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yep. Exactly. Oh, it definitely is. Exactly. I actually used to tell people that it's like if you know how to use Word, you can use a classic editor. It's almost the same thing. All right. So it looks like I am up against my time, guys. Thank you for coming out. I will be around all day if you have any more questions.